And we'll now move to the uh, second case on our docket, which is the state of Florida versus Dorch. second here. You may proceed. Thank you, Your Honor. Joseph D. Coronado, Jr., uh, Assistant Attorney General on behalf of the state. Um, the issue here before this court today is to resolve a conflict amongst all the uh, DCAs um, where the fourth, contrary to the decision of the first, third, and fifth districts, held that a motion to withdraw a plea was not required uh, to raise a challenge to the voluntary and intelligent nature of the plea. Mr. Mr. Coronado? Yes. Uh, the record here shows that on <coughs> October 15, 2015. Yes. Three and a half years ago. Yes. Uh, counsel raised the competency to proceed of Mr. Dorch. Yes, Judge. If, if you look at that. I, yes. I understand. Just stay with me for a second. All right. He pled guilty or no in 2016. Correct. So as of this date, Mr. Uh, Coronado, Mr. Uh, I'm sorry, Mr. Dorch has been in prison has been behind bars for almost three and a half years. And as we stand here today, there has not been a judicial determination that he is competent to proceed. Am I correct? Correct. A judicial determination that he's not competent. So as, as he sits in prison today, he is deemed to be not competent to proceed. I disagree with that, Judge. How is that? Well, he was never, there was never an adjudication of incompetence, yes, but there was also never necessarily a request for a hearing in that sense. If you we looked, have, if we you have looked ruled, at the motion. We have ruled repeatedly that merely raising the question of incompetent to proceed is sufficient to force the proceedings to stop until he or she is determined to be competent to proceed. So once, it, once on October 15, 2015, it was determined, it was requested that be a, that, uh, that, that counsel be about that Mr. Dorsch be evaluated for competency. As of that date, he was incompetent to proceed until he was determined to be competent. An examination was requested, but if you look at the actual motion, and, and the motion is really, uh, I mean, ultra bare bones. I mean, it, it doesn't say anything. There was no observations on part of defense counsel. Um, there was no observations in the order that followed from the judge. I mean, it was really just simply uh, four lines of which they cited the rule 3.210B, but, but nothing more. And he waived the 20 day requirement for a hearing. And that's significant because if you look at the actual order that the trial judge issues a few days later, there's no mention of any rule, only the findings that the examining doctor could have made or, or should make in, in his actual report that he's rendering. So we don't really, and, and if actually the language that's contained within that order, it kind of implies that there's other reasons, not necessarily just to determine his competency for the whole court to determine, but really to determine, you know, what's the relationship going on between the defendant well, and his counsel. If I, if I understand you correctly, the defense counsel came in. Correct. On October 15th said, Your Honor, I'm requesting that my client be evaluated, that you appoint a psychologist or whoever yes. to evaluate my client to see whether or not he is competent to proceed. That, you're saying, is not sufficient? Yes and no. Yes, in the sense that he well, has to follow the, he, he, <laughs> it's, it's kind of tough. Yes, in the sense that he has to follow the, the motion, right. And he did follow a motion, but he made no observations. So we don't really know what was wrong with the defendant at that particular point in time. There was no, you know, oh, he's uh, 
making this type of action, that type of action that leads me as defense counsel to believe that, that he was actually incompetent. And there were no reasonable grounds that were actually justifying that motion that were mentioned in that, nor was the word reasonable ground or anything else of that matter mentioned in the, in the trial court's order, which is why the motion to withdraw plea is so important in this particular situation, because that gives us being appellate lawyers, the opportunity to review it and a court like yourselves to determine what is going on, to actually get into that moment in time and see what is happening. We don't have that here. We don't have anything. All we have is this bare bone motion and really a bare bones order waiving the actual hearing and any, uh, there's plenty of other reasons that, 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 the, that the trial court court of order it. There's, there's other rules, 3.216, which allows them to raise it as a def, uh, uh, confidentially between the defense counsel and his client to determine whether it's possible any insanity defenses or other things of that nature that could be happening here. Now, can, you, can you think of anything more fundamental than a criminal defendant be incompetent to enter a guilty plea that's going to result in him going to prison? Obviously, yes, there, there is, that is a very fundamental right, but that's kind of the point of a plea hearing. I mean, here we have a full colloquy by the trial court. I mean, the trial judge sat, evaluated the defendant, there was a complete interaction amongst the two of them. I mean, the defendant was here requesting this open plea. I mean, he was, he was adamant that he wanted to plea, that this was what going on. They had, I mean, at the Obviously, the, the plea transcript is quite quite at length between the two of them. He, he was represented it, at the time of the plea. It, he was hearing. represented by multiple defense counsels, yes. Um, well, what was the time between the motion that was made and the plea, plea hearing? The, the, between the motion and the plea hearing? Uh, yeah. About 10 months, give or take. Okay. And the, were there two cases? There were, there were two cases. And the, the yes, motion was made in one of the cases? The motion was made in the original case, which was a theft case. And uh, then theft was the guns. plea taken in the same case? The, uh, the, the, the and were charges from both cases resolved at the plea hearing? Yes, yes, it was a universal plea, yes, okay. yes. And um, was there any indication on the record at the plea colloquy that the defendant was incompetent? No. And he, and, and it was a traditional plea colloquy? A very traditional plea colloquy. I, I, I did notice in reviewing the colloquy, it did not seem to me that I saw, maybe I missed it, that the judge did what most judges do and ask about coercion or ask about any mental health issues. Was that missing from the colloquy here? I don't specifically recall, recall it being mentioned in there, but it, it didn't stand out to me within the, the plea trans transcript. As was it any, is it anywhere else in the record, though, a discussion of those things? Uh, no, absolutely not. You sure? What about the plea form? Well, oh, 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 yes, yes, Your Honor. The, the plea form, he does initial next to that. And they discuss pressure and prior mental health history, correct? C correct, yes. I see what and, and indeed, the, the questions of the plea colloquy, as I understand it, is have you reviewed that form, correct? Of course, yes. Have you read it, for, have you read it or someone read it to you? Yes. And what were the answers to those things? Uh, in the affirmative, yes. R was there any indication to the contrary? N no indication whatsoever. And indeed, the attorney signed the form and said that he had read it to his client and yes. the client understood it? Yes. Okay. Yes. L let, me, let me ask you this. After the plea was entered, the appointed counsel would have 30 days within which to file a notice of appeal, correct? Correct. And would also have 30 days within which to file the motion to withdraw plea if counsel had any good faith basis to question the competency of the defendant at the time of the plea. Yes. So either could have happened. Yes. Okay. Uh, and that's... And, and, and if we... If we rule as the fourth district did here, it would allow an attorney with no good faith basis to question the competency of the plea to nonetheless um, prevail on appeal just based on really what's nothing more than a te technicality when the plea colloquy, the questions and answers did address mental health and there was no indication of any competency issue. Exactly, that, that, that's exactly our point, is that it's really almost a per se reversible technical issue that the fourth has kind of um, um, ruled here. Um, and that kind of leads into the importance of, of, of this court's decision in, in Robinson v. State, which is there's a procedure. The procedure is you have to file a motion to withdraw a plea. And this, this court has repeatedly stated in, in multiple cases um, that there are really no exceptions to that rule. Um, so, so if, just so I'm clear, and I want to make sure where you're at, uh, so if a 
a motion to examine a defendant to determine whether he's competent to proceed or not is filed. Correct. And it just sits there. No, no actions taken on it. And then later on, I think here was like a year later or whatever, a defendant pleads guilty to a negotiated plea or whatever. I guess what you're saying is that that motion to determine competency is waived. I mean, we, we, we can speculate from the mere fact that counsel decided to take the plea, to recommend the plea, that, okay, now I really think he's competent. In this just, case, yes. These facts presented in this case, I would say yes to that question. I mean, it, I don't think it's something that necessarily can be determined every single time as the fourth has ruled. It should be something that evaluated on a case-to-case -case basis um, that, that was basically this court's reasoning, um, um, uh, I believe in Dorch, uh, not Dorch, um, I'm sorry, Darty versus State. And, and, and really, you have to look at the facts. Here, we, we don't have very much to go off of. And, and that's really why the does state it, is taking this position. I mean, isn't the answer to, to Justice LaBarga's question yes? And, and isn't it not an unusual circumstance? If there's a suppression motion that is filed but never called up for hearing at any particular time, um, and then there's an ultimate plea, all subsidiary motions that are pending are waived. You're waiving all of your rights. But that's the point of a plea, uh, is that you're waiving those fundamental rights there. Yes. Yeah. Um, so, so, which will bring us to our, to our second point. I, I guess, obviously, uh, the motion to withdraw a plea is obviously our, our first jurisdictional issue, and, and the state would present that to your honors there. Um, but the second is if, if this court finds that there were proper grounds for the appeal, um, the state is requesting that, uh, that the proper remedy to do that would be relinquishment. Um, this court in State versus Fowler um, determined that uh, cases, the facts of that case are a little bit different than here. Um, the, defendant was prior adjudicated incompetent in Fowler. Uh, but can, uh, can I go back? I, sure. I, I, your, your, your opposing counsel, I believe, seems to suggest, and I think he's going to argue to us in, in a few minutes, that this, is, this falls under the exception for jurisdictional purposes as otherwise provided by law. Um, tell me why that's wrong. I don't, I don't like that, and, and I, I think I know you don't like it. Tell me why it's wrong. <laughs> I'm, trying to, I'm trying to fabricate what, uh, how I should say it. Uh, <laughs> the reason why is, it, it, although it gets us to the same point, which is having the trial court figure out what is going on, um, it's kind of form over substance. I, I, mean, I mean, the point of, well, I, I, to, to me, would uh, be that to may be, least, That may be the case, but I need you to tell me why he's wrong. And if he's not wrong, I need you to tell me that, too. In other words, if you think that this does fall under the as provided by law exception, then I agree. We get to the same place no matter what, either through direct appeal or through a motion for, for uh, to motion to withdraw a plea. Um, so tell me, does this fall under the exception or not? I'm having a hard time following here, Judge. Uh, Justice, I'm sorry. I apologize. Yeah, I'm, not, as I'm, I'm not being clear? Yeah, just Okay, I apologize. So, it, so okay. as I understand it, let, let's back up. Uh, the rule where he says that you normally can never uh, appeal a NOLO plea unless two things. One, a reservation of rights. This isn't a reservation right. of rights case. The other is if... It is a subject matter jurisdiction issue, if there is a sentencing error, if the plea is involuntary, if preserved by a motion to withdraw a plea, Correct. or as otherwise provided by law. Oh, I see what you're saying. Yes. So w my question is, why is this not as otherwise provided by law? Well, otherwise provided by law, I think it, what the counsel is, is implicating here is that when you, the implications of that suggest <laughs> that you're entitled to a fundamental review of every plea that's coming out. Um, and, and to me, it kind of takes it beyond the scope of what that rule is set in place for. The, it, the rule is set in place for a very specific type of uh, I don't, appeal. I don't know that, that I read what the... counsel is saying is that. What I read him as saying is, is a little bit what Justice Labarga is asking, which is in Dotry we said that it's a fundamental right uh, that, that one have competency hearing, when, that these procedures laid out when it's properly raised. Here there was a properly raised motion. They didn't go through those things. And so this is one of those areas, as otherwise provided by law, that allows for an appeal despite the appeal waiver. That, that's what I understand your colleague, to, your opposing counsel, to be saying. And he'll tell me if I'm wrong on that. I think you're correct on the issue that he's raising, yes. Okay. Yes. So why is that wrong? Uh, like I said, it, it, I think it's kind of pre presupposing a lot of different things that happened. Um, one, it's presupposing that there, to me, the, the fundamental right that's at issue is that he was determined incompetent at some point in time. He is presumed mentally competent. That's here, certainly here true, but forward. once the proper motion is raised, he's entitled to certain procedures. I thought that's what Dotry said. 
Yes, but Deutsche was also had a different set of facts that were in front of it. That's true. It, it, it had a, he was a prior, priorly adjudicated incompetent. This was mostly about restoring his, his, his competence therefrom. So, so I, I think that is almost not really applicable in this particular case because we don't have that prior adjudication of incompetence. Really what we have going on here is it's almost a question as to whether or not I need to raise that issue. That's what, to me, the facts in this case are presenting. Whether is there a relationship issue between defense counsel and, and the defendant? Um, is there another way that we're raising this on, on behalf of defense? So, so we're kind of getting to that point, but a little bit too soon. It really requires a look at what was actually presented to the court here. Well, I, I don't know that I disagree with you that it would be best to have a factual laying out of these things. That's, that's your point. Right. But I, I guess my point is you've made a jurisdiction. You said this is a jurisdictional bar. Yes. That the only way you win that argument is if this is not as otherwise provided by law. Um, and what are some other examples of what the otherwise provided by law might be referring to? I mean, I guess it's tough to pretty to, to per se say exactly what that would be. I, I mean, I'm not quite sure how to answer that question. Uh, otherwise provided by law. I mean, it's kind of a catch-all phrase. Uh, I don't necessarily know anything that's ringing off the top of my head to, to, well, to suggest let's, let's look at some examples. In Novotin, we seem to suggest, even though I don't know that we quite said it this way, that double jeopardy violations are something that can be brought up, right? Correct. Okay. That's, that's a, a sure, constitutional sure. right. A double jeopardy violation, right. sure. So is this, of the, is this of the nature of that? I, I don't see it being that far. What about in TG? And TG said the deprivation of counsel for a juvenile is something as otherwise provided by law, right? Right, but there you had you had an issue in terms of being, um, um, in terms of being counseled by by uh, a juvenile being counseled by um, uh, um, his a juvenile being counseled. Period, uh, and that I think raises a completely separate, different, uh, completely and utterly different set of facts. Is someone who's potentially not competent to make these sorts of decisions not the equivalent of someone who's not represented by counsel or a juvenile is not represented by counsel? Well, it's more of a proper waiver of that particular issue. You know, whether whether the court led a, a proper factual basis in order to for for that counsel to make an for that defendant in this case a juvenile to make an informed decision of whether to discharge his counsel or not. Um, and I think juveniles are different. Period. Um, and TG, this court even said that this was a very very limited exception that they were creating there, um, and and affirmed that Robinson was what this court wanted to hold moving forward. Um, so I hope that answered your question. Best Counsel, you are now into your rebuttal time. Thank you, you Your Honor. Can, okay. I'll continue on rebuttal. Thank you. Your Honor, it's Benjamin Eisenberg on behalf of the respondent, Vernson Dorch. The issue in this case isn't so much whether my client is or is not incompetent because we do not know. The question really is whether the proper adequate procedures were followed in order to determine whether or not he's incompetent. That is a notion that has dated back decades earlier to the United States Supreme Court's decisions in both Pate versus Robinson and Drope versus Missouri, where the U.S. Supreme Court said the failure to observe procedures adequate to protect the defendant's right not to be tried and convicted while incompetent to stand trial deprives him of his due process right to a fair trial. This court recognized as much when it decided Dougherty. In Dougherty, this, trial, this court held quite clearly a trial court's failure to observe the procedures outlined in Florida Rules of Criminal Procedure 3.210 through 3.212 deprives the defendant of his due process right to a fair trial. That doesn't really answer the question, though, um, because we have something else at play here. Um, but I, I want to ask, before I go there, I want to ask you this. You seem to suggest, correct me if I'm wrong, but I, you seem to suggest that f if it's a fundamental error, that is something that is reviewable under the as provided by law standard, correct? Well, I, with a certain limitation that, yes, fundamental errors, I believe, are, can be raised in that, uh, in, under that subsection so long as they are done contemporaneously, is an issue that pertains contemporaneously with the plea. That's what the decision of Robinson said. That once a defendant enters a plea of guilty, the only points available for an appeal concern actions that took place contemporaneously with the plea. Right. So that would go, in this case, to the voluntariness of the plea, correct? Not to the voluntariness, to whether or not due process was followed. The problem in this case is that you have a motion filed by defense counsel. Whether or not the specifics on it were that much is probably due to attorney-client privilege. But if you, one is not competent, one cannot voluntarily 
plead guilty, correct? That's the whole point. That's why, as Justice Lawson said, it's very common in plea colloquies for a judge to conduct a competency inquiry to make sure that it's a voluntary plea. I know my own colloquies, I would always say that a defendant is voluntarily, then is competent to proceed and is voluntarily, intelligently, and knowingly entering to a plea. You'd make those findings. I agree that it impinges on voluntariness but it all, and intelligentness, but it also impinges on whether or not someone has a, a legal ability to enter into an agreement. Because a plea, as, as this court recognized a while ago, and as the U.S. Supreme Court recognized in Boykin versus Alabama, it is more than just a confession. It is basically there's nothing left to be do. Well, that, it's, that's the same thing for coercion, though. If someone is coerced into a plea, they obviously are not doing it of their own free will, and that also raises serious due process concerns, but it goes to voluntariness, right? I don't, I don't agree because I think it's a deprivation of due process. It does go to voluntariness. I agree with that. And if they had moved to withdraw the plea, it certainly could have been raised on that ground. However, it's also a due process violation, and that's what makes a fundamental error. I just, I'm, I'm concerned because in both Robin, in Robinson, we seem to lay out some very narrow grounds where you can't appeal other than these exceptions, and the exception that would seem to apply here would be voluntariness. And then in TG, I think your opposing counsel is correct that although we carved out an exception, we essentially said the rule of Robinson still stands and there is no other exceptions to that. Um, where, where does that leave us? Well, yes, Justice Luck, the rule of Robinson does stand. And in state TG, the rule of Robinson applied, but there was a reversal because the error was fundamental. But the court was very careful to note, quote, we again emphasize that in all other cases involving a challenge to the voluntariness of the plea, and I'm omitting a few things here, the procedure of Robinson should be followed. I agree, and fundament but fundamental error is not something that arises that often, especially okay, in the context of Okay, so I want to talk about fundamental error. So okay. this, this gets us to where I, I wanted to start. Sure. Is there a difference in your mind between a waiver of a right to a plea and a fundamental error that is reviewable, although unpreserved, can still be reviewed? Fundamental error can be waived, but the problem is the person... No, not, not, not the error can be waived, but a waiver of a right to appeal versus I can appeal a, an error that I did not preserve. But are, those I don't, two, are those two different concepts? I'm not quite sure how to answer because I'm going to say that in a situation where someone may or may not be incompetent, that person well, can't make the decision of whether... That, that, take that out of it for a second. Is there a difference between a Can you ask the question again? Yes. Is there a difference between I waive my right to appeal versus I did not object and am... Uh, raising an unpreserved error under the fundamental error doctrine. Yes, I think there is a difference because okay. one, you're not allowed to bring the appeal at all. Isn't that what happened here? Well, no, he never waived his right to appeal. Let's look at the plea colloquy. Okay. Uh, page 12 of the P colloquy, 87 of the, of the, uh, of the record. Your court, you're giving up your right to an appeal that there will be no appeal unless I were to give you an illegal sentence. Do you understand that? Defendant, yes, Your Honor. Well, first off, I would point out that the client may or may not in this context be incompetent. Again, but putting that aside, isn't that a waiver of a right to appeal? But this was not, I don't, I don't believe so because this was an open plea. This was not a plea agreement where the defendant agreed to, just because the judge said that, that's not something that's part of the, a plea agreement. And he has, this court held uh, back in 2000 in, in Leonard that defendants have the right to appeal from a plea. I do not believe it's part of the plea, plea agreement, but regardless of whether or not it is. And the, the exception is those that are listed in 9.140, right? Well, I agree, but as, as the U.S. Supreme Court held in Pate versus Robinson decades ago, there the state made a similar argument that the defendant had waived his ability to have a competency hearing. And the U.S. Supreme Court said, quoting from Pate versus Robinson, it is contrary to argue that the defendant may be incompetent and yet knowingly or intelligently waive his right to have the court determine his competency to stand trial. And the same issue applies here. Here you have a defense attorney who, after speaking with the defendant, after observing his mannerisms, has determined that the defendant, there is something to cause the defense attorney to believe that that person is incompetent. They instituted the procedures of 3.210, and I do want to point out that the order specifically references 3.210B. It says, if the doctor is appointed for purpose of determining competency pursuant to Florida Rule of uh, Criminal Procedure 3.210B. So that is the rule that was implicated here. And as this court recognized in Daugherty, and recognized decades ago in Fowler versus State, the rule 3.210B does not have any discretion in it. It uses terms such as shall and immediately. And as this court held in Dowry, that, that shows that the requirements of that rule are required, 
They are necessary, and they cannot be waived. I will point out on the issue let, of fundamental Let me ask you an unrelated issue, and, sure. and I should know the answer, and I apologize. Um, but but I, I, I do know that all defendants are presumed to be confident until. And the question is, is that until there's a competency determination or until the motion is filed requesting? What, what's the until? Well, I think it's until someone has raised the issue of comedy such that... I mean, but the, the law is very specific. I just yeah. don't remember what the until is. I, well, I, I, I think it's until there's a determination of incompetency that a person is legally presumed to be competent. I'm pretty confident that's the law. I'm just... I believe that they are, but at I the mean, same time... Okay, once so, the, so the defendant here would be pre legally presumed competent at the time of the plea hearing, correct? I believe so, but whether or not yeah, he is, he has still been denied due process. Once somebody questions the competency of the defendant, that mm -hmm. needs to be resolved. Uh, exactly. Uh, but, I mean, but, but that's because the procedural rule says it's to be resolved. But in terms of the legal presumptions, I'm pretty confident the case law is that you're presumed competent until there's a determination otherwise. And then, and then you're presumed incompetent until there's a different determination. I mean, I think that's the way the law is pretty much black letter law at that. But as Justice Labarga was starting to mention... So, so you, assuming that's correct, you have a defendant that's entering a plea who would be presumed competent. I understand that there's a rule that says that once it's... once the issue's raised, it needs to be determined. You also have appointed counsel who would have a, a, a duty to raise competency if he had any basis to believe that the defendant was incompetent, and correct? Huh? And he did. No, no, at the case. time of the plea plea colloquy. There's a lawyer standing there representing this person who would have a duty at that point to say, Judge, um, hold on, I, I need, I, I have a reason to believe that my client may not be competent and they would have an obligation to raise it at the plea hearing. I mean, clearly that's true, correct? Correct. However, they've already okay. challenged. And then you the have conference. a judge that has a legal obligation to stop everything if the judge during the plea colloquy has any indication that the person isn't competent, correct? And the trial judge in this case did enter an order to determine competency because one of the parties, that is defense counsel, felt that there were reasons to I'm challenge. I'm talking about what's going on at the, the plea hearing and the protections other than the rule that are there to assure that a person who really is incompetent at the time of plea has all the protections, that we have a presumption, but we also have an attorney and a judge who are duty-bound by law to raise the issue at that hearing if there's any b reason to believe that the person is not competent, correct? Well, they were duty-bound to follow the rules set forth by 3.210. Okay, that's a different question. I understand that. Yes. But they also were duty-bound to raise the issue during the competency hearing and get that issue addressed if there was any indication at that time that the defendant was, in fact, incompetent. Justice Lawson, I agree, but at the same time, okay. it's pretty clear on the face of the record that defense counsel was not providing... And then you have an appellate lawyer or the appointing counsel who was duty-bound to file a motion to withdraw a plea if he had a good-faith basis to believe that the defendant did not voluntarily enter the plea based on a competency issue, correct? Well, well, no, Your Honor, because the problem is, and as the Fourth District Court of Appeal it indicated, by the time it gets to an appellate lawyer, which is, as you mentioned, I would not be able to move to withdraw the plea because the time to file a motion to withdraw a plea post Who files a notice of appeal? The trial counsel. Right. Well, you mentioned appellate counsel. No, no, I oh, said had, had an appointed counsel. Oh, appointed right? counsel. Oh, yeah. I thought you said appellate counsel. Okay. Yes, the trial counsel, sure, but the trial counsel in this case was also of the belief that the Rule 3.210 procedures could, could be could waived. You, could you, if you had a, a reasonable basis to question the competency of your client at the time of the plea, could you as appellate counsel have asked to relinquish jurisdiction to have the issue to file a motion to withdraw a plea? I know, Your Honor, because at that time it would be time barred. And the problem as recognized by the Fourth District Court of Appeal would be the only remedy at that point would be for the defendant who may be and may, may have been and may still be incompetent to file a 3850 motion on his own because you're not entitled to counsel on a post-conviction motion. And that's the problem that goes on in this case. We have a defense counsel who, from the get-go, waived the procedures of 3.210 after saying that the defendant had met the, 
had met the uh, standards for potentially being incompetent. And the error that happened in this case is, quite frankly, far more egregious than what occurred in Dari. And there, you at least had three competency evaluations that came back to the defendant was competent, and trial court stipulated that he was competent. But here we have nothing in the record. We don't know if there is even an evaluation, because the procedures were not followed. So we have a person we, who we, may we, or may we, not. We do have a plea colloquy that's, that is the record that, that in, would indicate that the defendant was competent at the time he entered the plea. But, and we, have the but we don't know, because, if, if, because there are issues with incompetency, and there's a reason that experts are appointed, and there's a reason that the trial judge has to make the determination based on the expert reports, because there are nuances to competency that, can not, that may not show itself on the face of a, of a plea, but th that's why there are mandatory requirements. I will note that in Pate versus Robinson, which was the U.S. I mean, Supreme in, Court. In, in so, my experience, there may be close questions when you have someone who has significant mental health issues as to competency, but I, I wouldn't say that in most cases it's a nuanced question whether someone has the mental capacity to understand the rights that they're giving up. I mean, generally, we trust the ability of a trial judge and a plea colloquy to engage with the person and, and make that determination, as Justice Luck said, before entering the plea. Isn't I, that? I understand, but in this case, the plea colloquy, as was mentioned during the initial argument, doesn't illustrate any questions regarding competency. Whether or not that's in the plea form, there was no oral colloquy to go through what, we don't have any record. We don't have anything to say that this person is competent or presuming that. I will note that it does, the plea form also says that the defendant entered this plea contrary to the advice of his counsel and that the trial judge said, oh, there's going to be a three-year mandatory minimum, and the defendant kept asking that, for, that he serve no time and that everything be made to probation. There are questions in that regard. I, I understand that alone may not have triggered a sua sponte need for a competency evaluation, but the, the point is that the procedures set forth by 3.210 uh, through 3.212 are mandatory. That's a, that is a rule of law that has come down for decades with this court, beginning with Fowler, continuing with Dougherty. They are mandatory, and I will note also that every district court of appeal in the state of Florida has found that when a defendant goes to trial in this situation, that is fundamental error that can be raised for the first time on a plate. And is, and is the implication of what you're saying, though, that once um, the defendant sets that process in motion, that it essentially becomes not waivable? Because, I mean, it sounds like what you're saying is, is it almost, it doesn't matter how explicit, how detailed, even if they had said to the judge, we know that you had previously ordered this examination and it hasn't happened, but we don't care. It sounds like the implication of what you're saying is that you'd still be here making the same arguments because once you've set that in motion, we can't, we basically can't trust anything that you do beyond that point. Yes, Your Honor, Justice Muniz, there are specific procedures that are mandatory. Uh, 3.210 specifically states shall and immediately. It says time requirements. It's but both it, mandatory and not. I mean, I know it's not mandatory vis-a-vis -vis the judge, but it's also not waivable. Yes, because once again, as, as the United States Supreme Court said, it is contrary to argue the defendant may, may be incompetent and yet knowingly or intelligently waive his right to have the court determine his competency to stand trial. The decision in this case whether or not the defendant was competent was not for trial counsel. It was for the, the trial judge, and it was, made, it was to do so based on the report reports of the experts. And we don't know, that we, we know that the trial judge in this case must not have ha seen any reports because there aren't any in the record. Would, would you agree that, do you agree that with the remedy suggested by the state that this should be um, remanded or relinquished for a competency determination if you have a reasonable basis to question the competency of your client at the time the plea was entered? Well, the remedy is set forth by Dougherty is for a nunc pro tonc competency hearing to determine whether or not. That is in, in the get-go. As to whether or not relinquishment must be, relinquishment of jurisdiction must be the remedy, I believe it can be a remedy. Obviously, this court did so in Fowler, so it is possible. But I don't think it has to be the remedy in every case. Specifically in plea, in plea issues, as this court's decision in Leonard and Robinson set forth, there are very limited grounds upon which you can a challenge a plea. Uh, just two weeks ago, I was here arguing a case where it was a, it was a plea with a warrantless blood draw, where is they reserving the right to appeal a denial of a motion to suppress. So right now, the rules of criminal procedure do not set forth a mechanism for relinquishing jurisdiction to determine well, competence. Said that if, if possible. If possible. If possible. And uh, one of the problems in Dougherty was that the counsel, the attorney, stipulated to competency. 
Yes, Your Honor. And we determined that the, uh, the judge did not have to accept that stipulation, and, and the judge himself or herself, uh, based on observations, can make a determination on competency and disregard these stipulations. And for that reason, the judge plays an integral uh, part in the, in the proceedings. So the issue here would be, if you send it back, uh, is whether Mr. Dorch was competent at the time he entered the plea. If you don't have the same judge who presided over that plea and over that case, then perhaps you don't have that judicial observation as of the time the plea was entered. That's the only concern I would have with that. Yes, Your Honor, and, and, and Your Honor authored Dougherty, and in, both in Dougherty and the United States Supreme Court have warned that uh, non-proton competency hearings are very difficult, even under the most favorable settings, to do. And, and as Your Honor pointed out also, um, the reports in a competency decision are merely advisory to the court, which, it's, which itself retains the ultimate decision of whether or not the defendant is competent. Here, the problem is that that issue was never presented to the trial judge because it was waived. We never had a hearing. We never had a judicial determination. And we don't know what exactly happened. A new, a new public defender took over shortly after the competency evaluation was taken. We don't know whether this case fell through the cracks. The defendant may be competent. He may be incompetent. That's why experts need to make that determination and we need to have expert reports that guide that decision. It can't be done strictly from is, a cold record. Is Judge Vaughn still on the bench? I'm not sure. I'm not, I, I'm not sure if he's in criminal. I, I don't know if he switched out. Well, whether he's in criminal, I mean, is he still a judge? I'm not 100% I'm not okay. certain. Um, and then you would agree that this only affects the conviction with regard to the case where the competency evaluation was, uh, was sought, not in the, the, what we used to call in Miami the inside charge, the, uh, the assault charge of a prisoner. No, Your Honor. Actually, at the, at the Fourth District Court of Appeal, both cases were consolidated because the argument was that it affected both cases. Because if he's incompetent to enter a plea into one case, he'd be incompetent to he'd enter both pleas. How, how can, how, sorry, please go but, ahead. Okay. But, I mean, if you're relying on a, a technicality, really, because there's no argument that there's a good faith basis to believe that the presumption of competency is not valid in this case, then it seems like if if the the sentence that you're concerned about was entered in a case in which the motion was never filed that, I mean, if we're going to technically follow the rules, then we technically follow the rules. And that was an issue in the case where it was filed, but it's not an issue in the case where it wasn't filed. Well, I mean, just as awesome. than anything else, I mean, because you, that's what you're relying on, a very technical, th this has to be followed by the T, the letter of the law. And it happened, it happened a year later. The, sec the inside charge happened about a year after the, right. the request. The initial one, the first charge was October 2015. Right. Uh, that was actually, no, October 2015 was when the competency evaluation, but then the, uh, ultimately the second charge came out in uh, 2016, and the plea occurred in March 2016. Right. Uh, but and, and, that, and just I, to be clear, competency was never raised by motion or otherwise in the second case. No, it was not. But it also was not raised in this appeal in the states, the petitioner, they have a challenge that the Fourth District Court of Appeal reversed both of them. If it's not raised in the initial brief, then it's waived. But I do want to say, I, I contest the allegation that this is a technicality. This is a matter of due process. Uh, the, the United States Supreme Court has said so for, for quite a few decades, and this court has said so in Dougherty as well. If a defendant may or may not be incompetent, it, it affects whether or not they can make this legally binding decision. It goes to, as the First District Court of Appeal said in Shaheen, the nature of competency goes to the heart of whether a defendant has the capacity to make a cogent, legally binding decision. And if he can't, then that is a denial of due process. I see that I've used up all my time. If you have no further questions, I would ask that this court confirm. Thank you. I'll be very brief. Um, I agree with, with Justice Lawson here and, and Justice Luck that we're presuming a lot. Um, we're kind of getting ahead of the, uh, of the horse here a little bit in the sense that not only are we presuming that he is incompetent when we're talking about what my uh, opposing counsel here is arguing, but we're also presuming that all the attorneys here, now there's not just one defense counsel, there's two defense counsels, two trial lawyers, and a state attorney here, assistant state attorney, who have all dropped the ball in this case, assuming th that argument stands. I mean, there's plenty of other explanations that we can offer um, as to why the examination was requested by defense counsel. Um, and moving forward, 
that would be the state's position, that that is why it is so important for the motion to withdraw a plea, so that we can go back and look into what everybody was thinking at that particular point in time. We have no record of that now. The speculation could, be, could have been resolved quite easily by just holding a hearing or bringing up the issue. And see, that, that, where I come from, in the criminal division, we get two or three days a week. Sure. And, and uh, no case is allowed to proceed, at least in my courtroom, until that determination is made. So if you are defense counsel and you raise, judge, uh, I, I asked the court to, to uh, order an evaluation for my client's competency. Just the mere raising that, that rings bells in my head. There's something wrong here. Yeah, and it, it, and, and uh, whether somebody dropped the ball or whatever, uh, this case proceeded until there was a determination that he was competent. Uh, so that's that's the problem, and, and that's. I think the that kind of plays into what the holding in State versus or Robinson versus State was, which, if it's presented to the trial court in a motion to withdraw a plea, that trial judge can easily rectify the situation right there on the spot. You know, if this was if this was an actual issue that they were all working on there, the trial judge at the first point at the first point possible could have easily corrected the, the issue, which is another of the state's arguments here. That, you know, we want to put as many things and keep as many things as we possibly can to quickly and efficiently resolve these but issues why, at the trial does, court. But why put that burden on the defendant <coughs> when the defendant already raised the motion? Right. I, I, I mean, mean, it isn't... I mean, should there not be some burden on the state also as well to say there's a motion pending, Your Honor, before you take this plea on competency? To a certain degree, yes. I mean, is this any different than a Ferretta, if there's a Ferretta request? If there's a Ferretta request, but I think there's and a little you more. take the plea and there's a motion pending and there's a Ferretta hearing, should there not be a Ferretta hearing prior to taking the plea? Yes. And what happens if you take the plea and there's a motion for a Ferretta pending? Well, then you have an obvious Ferretta issue there uh, that would What's be What's going to happen to that case? Probably going to go back. But I think in, the, well, in that how, Ferretta how issue, is, I think we have a little more facts because now not, you have a record. Excuse me. Yes. How is this different than Ferretta? We're talking about due process, a person's ability to understand what the proceedings are. How is this different than Ferretta? You have a little more facts than a Ferretta case, uh, in a Ferretta case. Here, we, we really don't have anything. I mean, we're, we're, we're all presuming that, that this is actually needed to go to a hearing even. You know, I mean, it, it, this was just a motion for examination. There was no hearing that was requested. So this, that's presuming that the defendant was, you know, having some incompetency issues that weren't properly documented at all during the motion or by the trial court's order. You know, there, the trial court in a Fred situation. Okay, counsel, you're, you're in overtime now. You can uh, sum up in about 30 seconds if you could. <laughs> well, we just ask that uh, this court reverse uh, the decision of the Fourth District Court. Thank you very much. All right. We thank you both for your arguments in this case. The court will now stand in recess for about 10 minutes. All right.